seeking a biblical understanding of God's view of marriage, divorce, and remarriage. I've entitled it, I do until I don't, which I believe just encapsulates the attitude that many have in this world concerning this institution of marriage. I know that it is a very sensitive issue. It's also one that's hotly debated and it can cause, you know, it's been the subject of much pain and strife. My goal is not to cause strife or pain or sorrow, but to simply consider what the Bible says and teaches on this very important issue. So I want to continue this morning looking at the subject of marriage and the issue of divorce or the dissolution of marriage. As I mentioned last week, I want to cover this um, topic or subject over the course of a few messages. I think there'll be another two following this one. It is important that we consider the full counsel of Scripture on marriage in a society that increasingly treats it with contempt. And if you don't think that that contempt of the world has br bled into the church, you're wrong. Marriage, as we saw last week, is not a man-made institution, sentiment, or ideal. It was created and designed by God when he created humanity itself. He created man, male and female, in a marriage relationship. He defined it. He created it. And that's why we need to heed his commands concerning it. Let's have a look at the portion of scripture that we were looking at just a moment in Matthew chapter 19. Chapter 19 of Matthew, as well as Matthew chapter 5, is really a major battleground within the subject on divorce, which was the question or the subject of which the Pharisees were, were testing Jesus with. And I just want to read Matthew chapter 19, and I'm going to read from verse 3 to verse 6. Matthew chapter 19, verses 3 to 6, the Bible says, The Pharisees also came unto him, tempting him, and saying unto him, Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? And he answered and said unto them, Have ye not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female? And said, For this cause shall a man leave father and mother, and shall cleave to his wife. And they twain shall be one flesh. Wherefore, they are no more twain, but one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. Let man not separate. Now, if you recall, this question that is posed of Jesus and Jesus' subsequent response came in the context of a debate amongst the Pharisees at the time of Jesus' ministry upon the earth. There was a debate between two schools of thought concerning marriage and divorce. The liberal teachings of Hillel and the more conservative stance of Shammai. We see as they put forward this question, is it lawful, in verse 3, for a man to put away his wife for every cause? Now that is a statement of the Hillel position which allowed man, uh, a man to put away his wife, divorce her for almost any reason. I read to you, you know, some of those, those laws, uh, rabbinical teachings, that even if she oversalted a dish, that was just cause under the school of Hillel to put away your wife. If there was anything that displeased the man, or, you know, as another rabbi said, if you found another lady that was more attractive, that was also just cause to put away your wife. That was the school of Hillel. Whereas the school of Shammai was only on the basis of infidelity, adultery. And so here the phrase for every cause 
shows that they were asking after the Hillel position. Jesus, in answering this question, however, points to God's design for marriage. Rather than entering into the debate of when one might justly put away one's wife, Jesus holds up the institution of marriage as a dissoluble union that man should not separate. What God has joined together, let not man put asunder. Let not man separate. And he appeals to the scriptural account of creation. As you see him say there in verse 4, have ye not read? He points to the Bible. Have you not read? And he takes, we went and had a look at these two passages last week. Genesis chapter 1 and verse 27, where he says that he that which made them, made them male and female. God made man, male and female, in his image to exercise dominion over the earth. And then he quotes Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2 and verse 24, where we see after the creation of woman, and remember, woman was special. She wasn't created like man was created. She wasn't created like the animals were created. Animals created like the, like the animals were created out of the dust of the earth, though in the image of God. Woman was created out of man, was literally flesh of his flesh, bone of his bones. Now, God could have formed woman out of the, out of the dust, but he formed them, formed her, as a union with him. And as a result, Moses then gives that instructive statement under the inspiration of the Spirit of God, saying, For this cause shall a man leave father and mother and shall cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. God joins them together. Every subsequent marriage. And Jesus says what God has joined let not man put asunder. It elevates. It elevates <coughs> marriage. As being an indissoluble union. Permanent. One flesh. As I made mention to you, it didn't matter after that what Adam did. Eve would always be bone of his bones and flesh of his flesh. Unique. United. Marriage isn't a cohabitation of two people for life. That's not marriage. But it is a union of a man and a woman as one by God. From Jesus' words here in Matthew 19, we learn that God created and designed marriage and is an active participant in the establishment of every marriage relationship. There's not a marriage that occurs that God's not involved in. Now, as I mentioned last week, God is the one who defines what marriage is. It is monogamous, heterosexual, one man, one woman, united as God. Uh, united as one by God. He is involved. God's will and design for marriage must thus be our primary concern and consideration in all discussions of marriage. If he designed it, he's the one who knows how it works. Would you agree? Which means when he gives commands to husbands and he gives commands to wives, if you don't follow those commands, your marriage is going to be terrible. And always, when there is a problem in a marriage, it's because there is disobedience to God's commands concerning marriage. Every time. Every time. It's His design, not our design, which means we must take our instruction from Him. We must conform and submit ourselves to those instructions and commands. It is not our union, it is His. 
We must not seek to dissolve it ourselves. That's why Jesus says, let not man put asunder. Let not man separate. God has established this union. Let God separate it. I think there is often an inconsistency between people's attitude towards a good principle or rule and the enforcement of it. I think there's a big discrepancy there. Often, I've heard people express delight by the establishment of a rule or a precept until they are inconvenienced by it. I've often heard someone declare their delight for strong and decisive leadership, whether it be in the workplace, church, or in the home. Ah, oh, that's what I want. I just want strong, decisive leadership. Until, until they disagree with the direction that the leader has decided. Then all of a sudden, there's a problem. And I think that's true of every, yes, I love the fact that there's law and order. And then the policeman waves you down. Oh, I should be doing real arguments. <laughs> Love the idea until you are inconvenienced by it. I think the same is true of people's attitude towards marriage. Everyone rejoices at a wedding. And why is a wedding special? A wedding is special because you have a man and a woman entering into what? A lifelong covenant and commitment together. And everybody's come to witness that covenant and that commitment. People rejoice over that. I think people are caught up in the romanticism of two individuals committing their lives to one another. But the force of that commitment is often glossed over. Do you realize what that covenant is? It is a vow before God until what? Death. Death do us part. Do we understand the gravity of what that vow is? I am with you until death. until I don't like that commitment anymore. Sounds amazing. Sounds amazing. Sounds so romantic. Until marriage is hard. Until your spouse disappoints you. Until you're unhappy. Until it didn't work out the way you wanted it to work out. You find out your spouse is a sinner. It works both ways. We're no longer in love. Does the Bible give credence to that? Love is an action, a choice, not an emotion. When marriage turns to an everyday struggle, ah, divorce is seen as the solution. Some even counsel divorce should be what should be on the cards. Personal happiness rather than God's will is established as the basis for it, for giving one's vow before the Lord. Does God want you to be happy? Does God want you to be happy at the expense of, of obedience? Is there suffering in obedience? God is concerned with your eternal happiness. Your eternal blessing. Which means that we ought to follow his will. That he may bless us for that obedience and faithfulness. If you are married, did you say, until death do us part? Consider the vows of a traditional Christian marriage. I do promise before God and these witnesses. For who? 
Do you think that that's light? I promise and call upon God to witness what I'm about to say. Do you think that's light? Do we not fear the Lord? To have and to hold you from this day forward, for better or for worse. Oh, I thought it was just better. <laughs> for richer or poorer, in sickness and in health, to love and to cherish till death do us part, according to God's holy word. And there too I pledge you my faithfulness. Now one might say they haven't fulfilled their part. Was your vow conditioned upon the fulfillment of theirs? One might say, I got married at court. Yet Jesus says that God has still joined you together. God is both witness and the confirmation of your covenant, even at the Department of Home Affairs. <laughs> My point in all this is that these words that are often spoken flippantly, romantically, are often uttered without due gravity. <clears throat> People like the idea of these vows, enamored by their romanticism, until one reminds them of it when marriage gets tough. But we were so young, I'm sure I married the wrong person. I didn't know what they were like. But you made a vow before God. That's when the full force of a lifelong commitment comes into play. We like the idea and the principle until it comes to the enforcement. Then we see all manner of justifications, arguments, and unspoken conditions. And I know that that's tough. I know that that's difficult. And I know that there are marriages that are very difficult, very hard, and there's very extenuating circumstances, and many. But marriage is not a trivial union or covenant because God is involved. God joins together and God bears witness. Turn with me back to Malachi. Malachi, where we were in our scripture reading this morning. There are portions within this passage that are difficult to understand. We're not going to do an in-depth exegesis of it. But there are some key points that I think we can have a look at within this passage that I think are telling. Malachi chapter 2, and verses 13 through 16. Verse 13, Malachi chapter 2. And this have ye done again, covering the altar of the Lord with tears, with weeping, and with crying out, insomuch that he regardeth not the offering any more, or receiveth it with good will at your hand. In other words, they were weeping. There were tears in front of the altar because God was not accepting their offerings. God didn't delight in their sacrifices. And there was emotion and tears and crying out and weeping. Why? Why do I not have this fellowship with the Lord? Why does he not receive me? Hmm. They ask. They ask. Verse 14. Yet he say, wherefore? Here's the reason. Because the Lord hath been witness between thee and the wife of thy youth, against whom thou hast dealt treacherously. You've done wrong to your wife, of which I have been a witness Yet is she thy companion and the wife of thy covenant. You've entered into a covenant. She is your partner, your companion. And did not he make one? Yet had he the residue of the spirit, and wherefore one, that he might seek a godly seed? Therefore take heed to your spirit, and let none deal treacherously against the wife of his youth. For the Lord, the God of Israel, saith that he hated putting away. What's putting away? Divorce. Divorce. 
putting away means sending away. It's very reminiscent of, of Deuteronomy 24.1. When a man found this pleasure, he would write a certificate of divorce and send her away out of his home. Putting away. The Lord hates it. Hates it. We see that their offerings, as I mentioned, are not being accepted by the Lord. Because God desires obedience more than sacrifice. Isn't that what Samuel said to Saul? God desires obedience more than sacrifice. They were not accepted because of their treachery and unfaithfulness towards their wives. Their marriages were a problem. They were divorcing their wives. Do you know that your communion with God is ad- adversely affected by your willful sin towards others. Did you know that? You want this to be right. Well, this is wrong. God's not happy with that. Let alone if it's your wife. What does Jesus say in Matthew chapter 5? Therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar, and there rememberest that thy brother hath ought against thee, leave there thy gift before the altar, and go thy way, first be reconciled to thy brother, and then come and offer thy gift. Don't come to worship the Lord when you know that there's a problem between you and your brother. Go and make that right. Then come and worship God. What were they doing? They were bringing their offerings before the altar while having divorced their wife. What about forgiveness? You know the Lord's Prayer. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. You know, a lot is said in that Lord's Prayer. Do you know what Jesus emphasizes at the end of that model of prayer? Do you know what he emphasizes? Forgiveness. This is what he says. Verse 14 and 15, after quoting the Lord's Prayer, Thy be the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. For if ye forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if ye forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Is that strong? It's reiterated in Matthew 18. I refuse to forgive you. But please, I repent. I refuse. Don't don't think this is going to be right. First Peter, chapter 3, verse 7. This is for husbands. Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge, talking of your wife. Give honor unto the wife, as unto the weaker vessel. And it's all about physical strength there. And as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. Do you realize that then your fellowship and relationship with God can be adversely affected by the way you treat your wife? Amen. 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 <laughs> Do not think that you have fellowship with God and closely walk with Him when your relationship with others is not right. The reason that we see here within this portion of Scripture in Malachi is that they had done wrong to their wives by putting them away, by divorcing them. They had done wrong. It says there that God was being witness to their covenant. It declares there It says, because the Lord hath been witness between thee and the wife of thy youth. When often God was called upon as witness in the establishment of a covenant. And in being called as that witness to also act as judge between the participants of that covenant. We don't have time to turn there, but you might recall the covenant that was made between Jacob and Laban. That area whereby... I will not cross over, you will not cross over this line. And they call upon the Lord 
to witness and to judge between us. Here, God was making a judgment. Having borne witness, he was now making a judgment against these men who had dealt treacherously with their wives. And what had they done? They had put them away. And he declares that he hates this. He hates it. We must understand here that God hates divorce. Remember, we looked at last week. God's design is marriage. One man for one woman, for life. That's God's will. That's God's design. He hates divorce. He hates the disillusion. His design and participation in that union of the husband and wife need, means that it is never God's will that they be separated. He joins them together. It's not his will now that they split. No. His will is that they are one flesh. He designed it. He made it. He bore witness to it. He accomplished it. We must understand. I've heard before said, God is leading me or freeing me to divorce my wife. No, he's not. This cannot be. One cannot find a biblical basis upon which one can say that God is leading you to dissolve your marriage. Rather, the Bible always upholds God's establishment of it. Never its dissolution. Nowhere will you ever see the advocating for divorce in Scripture. Now, there may be grounds on the basis of sin, that one might be permitted to divorce and remarry. But that's not God's design or will. Nor is it the ever, ever, and please understand it, nor is that ever the advocated course of, of action. Never is that advocated. Divorce is not God's design and will. Marriage is. The breaking of one's covenant vow to your spouse is not God's will but rather the upholding of it. This means that as God's children desiring to fulfill God's will, our goal must always be to uphold, reconcile, and repair marriage relationships, never to dissolve them. That must be our goal as children of the Lord, because it's His will and design that they be one. So the first thing that I want you to see here this morning as we lead up into next week is that God hates divorce. Please don't think that he likes it. He doesn't. It's against his design. It's against his blueprint. It's against what he created. It's a perversion as a result of sin. I want to then have one more point with you this morning. Again, leading up into next week. Or the week thereafter. I think maybe mine is preaching this week, but the week thereafter. Unjustified divorce leads to sin against God. Turn with me to another passage that's a parallel to Matthew. We'll come back to Matthew <coughs> next time because there's some important things there that we need to, to still consider. But I want you to turn with me to Mark chapter 10. It's another portion of scripture that deals parallel with Matthew 19. Reading from verse 1, Mark chapter 10, verse 1. And he arose from thence and cometh into the coast of Judea by the farther side of Jordan. And the people resort unto him again. And as he was wont, he taught them again. And the Pharisees came to him and asked him, Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife, tempting him? 
And he answered and said unto them, What did Moses command you? And they said, Moses suffered to write a bill of divorce and to put her away. And Jesus answered and said unto them, For the hardness of your heart he wrote you this precept. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. And for this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave, and cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. So then they are no more twain, but one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together, let no man put asunder. Again, you see the statement here where Jesus is elevating marriage as, as this union that should not be separated. We see also here that the concession of Moses to divorce their wives was not God's will or design, but something that was permitted due to what? The hardness of their hearts. They had taken this precept as just and good, but it was given because of their stubbornness. It was casuistic. It means it wasn't a, a precept that was held up as eternal righteousness, but something that was regulating in the event that this happens, this is what you must do. It wasn't condoning it as something that God liked. God hates divorce. But I want you to notice what Jesus informs his disciples when they came and asked him later. Look at verse 10. And then the house of his disciples asked him again of the same matter. And he saith unto them, Whosoever shall put away his wife and marry another committeth adultery against her. And if a woman shall put away her husband and be married to another, she committeth adultery. Sure. That's an interesting statement. We understand well what adultery is. It refers to being sexually unfaithful to one's spouse. Do you agree? Here, Jesus declares that one has committed adultery against one's wife if you divorce her and marry another. Likewise, if a woman divorces her husband and marries another, she too is guilty of committing adultery against her husband. That's strong, eh? Hey? Now, with that in mind, go with me to Luke chapter 16. No, parallel. <clears throat> In these four passages, Matthew 5, Matthew 19, Mark 10, and Luke 16, represent all of where Jesus speaks on this matter of marriage and divorce. Okay? Luke 16 and verse 18. Whosoever putteth away his wife and marrieth another committeth adultery. Well, that's, that's just like Mark, right? There's another addition here. And whosoever marrieth her that is put away from her husband committeth adultery. So, you know, if a, if a woman is divorced from her husband and another man marries her, he's guilty of committing adultery. What does that tell you? It tells you an interesting one that it's a serious matter here that we're discussing. But, you know, but what it indicates here is that the initiation of divorce doesn't actually sever the bond that God has made between those two individuals. You see that? If you divorce and marry another, if you commit adultery against her, what does that mean? That human divorce hasn't severed what God has joined together. There is still a moral obligation to that spouse. You're still joined. <clears throat> even though you hold a certificate of divorce. That's quite something, isn't it? We know and understand that if divorce severed the bond, then they would be without obligation and could never be accused of committing adultery. No, 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 I haven't committed adultery. I'm not an adulterer. We're divorced. Not according to this passage. This stresses the nature of God's uniting together of husband and wife. This isn't a trivial union that man can simply dissolve without offending a holy God. To marry another person, or to marry a divorced person, according to these verses, sins against God. This means 
with the exception of possibly one or two cases, which we will consider in the following message. Divorce is most certainly wrong in the eyes of the Lord and results in adultery. And this ought not to be taken lightly. There ought to be a fear of the Lord that gives us pause when dealing with this issue. Divorce followed by remarriage, in most cases, is akin to having an affair. But our society says it's okay. Our society says it's reasonable. Our society says it's justified. What does God say? What does God say? He does not accept that. He regards it as sin. Now, one who is grieved and unhappy in their marriage might say this. Fair enough. But God will forgive me. Have you ever heard that said? It's sad how often I've heard a believer seek to take advantage of the grace of God in order to follow the path of sin. Knowingly. That's wickedness, guys. That's a high-handedness. That's rebellion. And a person should not think that they will escape the Lord's anger and chastisement over that. God is not mocked. That's what that is. That's mocking the Lord. And that grace that he has given is worthy of rebuke. As Paul says in Romans 6, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? He then says in verse 10 and 11, for in that he died, he died unto sin once. But in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Our attitude should not be, I've got to do this, and God will forgive me. Let grace increase. There's no fear of God. There's no fear of God. There's no love of God. What does John say in 1 John 5? This is love, for this is the love of God, that we keep His commandments, and His commandments are not grievous. Do you not understand it? You declare that you love the Lord, but then willfully and high-handedly go against His commandments. My friend, you don't love the Lord. You can't. If you love God, if you fear Him, you will seek to obey Him in your marriage. And let me be clear. Those of you that are married, God has given you commands on how you ought to be towards your spouse. Husbands, love your wives. As Christ loved the church, you are to put her first. You are to seek her highest good in everything at cost of yourself, even if it's never reciprocated. Men, do you understand that? Wives, this is a dirty word. You know it's coming. <laughs> Submit unto your husbands as to the Lord. In other words, to please the Lord. Now, please bear in mind that's not husbands subject your wives, bring them under submission. No, 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 no. That's a volitional act of the woman <coughs> to say, I will let you lead, I will be your help me. Because God has asked me to. Even though I think that your decisions are terrible. <laughs> even though I think you're a chop sometimes. <laughs> it doesn't matter. I bring myself up. God has commanded me. Do you love the Lord? Obey Him. Do you fear the Lord? Don't go against Him. Ah. <sighs> If you love him, you will not seek to separate what he's joined together. And I know that that's a tough thing. I know, and I appreciate how difficult that statement can be.
What of the one who divorces and does not marry, remarry? Is that sin? Well, it's clear from these verses that the issue is remarriage. Okay. Divorce in and of itself does not constitute adultery. Okay. Last one. I know I'm kind of out of time. But I, I need to kind of finish this before we can actually deal with what we need to deal with next time. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Just bring you with me. I won't keep you long, I promise. I'm, I'm, I'm there. You see? I'm there. 1 Corinthians chapter 7. So we see from Mark 10, from Luke 16. And even it's true of, of Matthew 19 and Matthew 5 that it's remarriage that results in adultery. Divorce in and of itself does not. But let's have a look. 1 Corinthians 7, look at verse 10 and 11. Paul speaking to the Corinthian believers, and unto the married I command, yet not I, but the Lord. Who's he talking about there? He's talking about the Lord's instruction during the course of of his ministry. It's a summary of the Lord's teaching while upon this earth. Let not the wife depart from her husband. Okay? But, and if she depart, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband. And let not the husband put away his wife. This is Jesus Christ's command. Jesus' command. An instruction here that one should not just divorce one's spouse. Let a husband not put away his wife, and let the woman not depart from her husband. That's the command of the Lord. Again, we see that God hates divorce, and it is not his design or his will. Some will take this verse as license to do what they want. You're going to have that. But I believe that this concession here that he provides is for extreme circumstances and it's still not God's desire or will. But in, if she depart, that's not the Lord's desire. That's not the Lord's will here. But and if she do, she must remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband. Now some will see that as an out as a thumbs up to go for divorce. But it's not that. The decision to divorce is not advocated here, but rather it is expressed as something outside God's desired will. It is casuistic. In other words, it's an if. Don't, but if you do, then do this. It's not advocating for then do this. This would be a concession due to the hardness of one's heart, much like we see in Deuteronomy 24, as was the case in Moses' day. However, note that even in such a case, you're not guilty of adultery in this. If you remain unmarried, if you're in that clause there in verse 11, divorce your husband, but then remain unmarried or be reconciled to your husband, you're not guilty of divorce. However, that does not absolve you from any moral responsibility towards your spouse. Reconciliation ought to be the goal. And if they remarry as a result of your divorce, not only are they guilty of adultery, but you also bear some responsibility in that adultery. Do you realize that? Matthew chapter 5, which will be a subject of further consideration in the next message. But Matthew chapter 5, verse 31, 32. It hath been said, verse 20, 31, it hath been said, whosoever shall put away his wife, let him give her a writing of divorcement. But I say unto you, that whosoever shall put away his wife, saving for the cause of fornication, that is going to be a cause that we'll be looking at next time. Cause of her to commit adultery. And whosoever shall marry her that is divorced, committeth adultery. 
Notice that if you put away your wife, and the implication is that she marries another, that person whom she marries is guilty of adultery, she's guilty of adultery, and you have been a cause for that adultery. Saving, you know, causeth her to commit adultery. Does that absolve you then of any moral responsibility? No. There is responsibility there. Here, Jesus, without absolving her guilt of committing adultery by remarrying, holds the husband responsible because he put her away. So we ought not to think of divorce apart from remarriage as something that is desirable or within the will of God in response to a difficult or unhappy marriage. Sorry. Divorce is not God's way, but rather the consequence of hard hearts. Your goal is to strive to make that marriage what God designed it to be. In as much and as everything that you can do. Let it never be that you stand before the Lord and that you did not do everything to please the Lord. Now, since adultery is not found in divorce, but rather in the act of remarriage following divorce, much of the debate on this issue involves the subject of remarriage following divorce, not divorce itself. The question is this, is there ever an occasion when one may divorce and remarry another without committing adultery? That's the question. And that's the ground where there's been much debate. Is there ever an occasion where one may divorce and remarry another without committing adultery? Or to put it another way, is there ever a time when remarriage is not a sin? In one instance, it's very clear cut. If your spouse dies, Bible's very happy with that. Okay. In fact, <laughs> you know what I mean. <laughs> I appreciate that that brings some liberty. But yes, the Bible's happy in the sense that you can remarry without committing adultery in that sense. That's what I mean. Not that you're happy that your spouse died. <laughs> but this question is what we'll be considering next time. Okay? This will be followed by a final message that will consist of some concluding remarks on this issue and exhortations to those who are married, divorced, remarried, and presently single. Okay? So next time, we will deal with this subject which is known as the exception clause. Let's consider that together biblically as what is meant by that, as well as the, the, the case of abandonment that is made from 1 Corinthians chapter 7. So we'll be looking at Matthew 5, Matthew 19, and 1 Corinthians 7 as we try and consider this. But please, I hope that in everything that I have said this morning, that it just upholds the sanctity of marriage and what God has joined together let not man separate let's pray Father God we thank you for your word we understand that some of these things can be difficult and sometimes run contrary to human wisdom and many things but we know that we need to trust you that you are right and perfect we are not and I pray, Lord, that we would seek your will in everything, that we would seek your glory and uplift you, putting you first in our lives in everything that we do. I pray for every person here that is married. I pray for their marriages. Our Father God, I pray that each one would have such an earnest desire to please you that they would seek to fulfill the commands you have given to them, whether they be the husband or the wife. I pray, Father God, that you would help them, strengthen them in their union, that they would make you the central figure, that it might be pleasing and acceptable in your sight. Thank you, Lord, for this time, for your word, the truth that you have given us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.